I have the privilege this morning to introduce to you our speaker. And Gary McIntosh actually is in the office of a bishop. And bishop, sometimes you might say, well, what is that? Well, it's a biblical term that means overseer. He oversees a number of ministry. He's ministries. He's the founding pastor of Transformation Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which now has literally exploded in the community. Uh, they, they have a membership and gathering of 4,500 people on Sunday mornings, and he'll share a little bit about that. But let me just share with you our relationship. Over the last 25 years, we've known this man of God. We've seen his integrity. We've observed him. He's been a voice of wisdom, guidance into Pastor Deb in my life and to the leadership of this congregation. He's not a stranger around here. Maybe this is the first time you've seen him or heard him, but he's not a stranger around here, and we're so honored to have him. And one of the things about this weekend, because we've had a number of meetings with him already, we had team night last night with our volunteers and our staff, but uh, the Lord put upon my heart that this weekend would be a defining moment in people's lives. It would be a defining moment for this church. And a defining moment is a moment where you come to a place where you make a choice, a decision. And it's a decision that will propel you into the future that God has for you. And so I believe that for us today, this is a defining moment for refuge for this church. Because Bishop Gary speaks prophetically where he goes, God uses him in that capacity. And he has a word, I believe, that is going to touch our heart and pierce our hearts. And so I'm so thrilled to welcome him to this church once again and to speak to you this morning from this platform. So at this time, let's stand together as we welcome Gary McIntosh. Thank you. You may be seated. Great to be with you this morning. I have always enjoyed my times of coming to Stevens Point and being at Refuge Church. I, uh, I do enjoy um, pre-winter a little bit more than winter visits. Amen. It can get cold up here. It can get really cold up here, but um, I'm excited to be here always with the Maliks. They're, they're wonderful people, and you're blessed people to have them as your pastors. Amen? Come on, give them a hand. Thank God for your pastors. Uh, I do bring you greetings from Tulsa. Uh, we've been on an amazing journey there as I turned the church over four and a half years ago to a young man who at the time was 27 years old and uh, full of God and full of life. And um, it was quite a, an amazing transition. We worked for several years prior to it. He took over and he was running. Amen. Amen. And um, we've gone from over 800 people to over 4,000 people now. Uh, we had to get a new building. We went to five Sunday morning services, and now we have a new building. It seats 4,500, and we're already full. And so we'll see what the next is. But it's always a good thing. Amen? Every problem we're having right now is a good problem. We have parking problems. We have seating problems. We had 484 children in Children's Church last Sunday. I'm thinking... That's scary. Amen. I, I, I can't imagine, and I don't want to imagine, um, but we thank God for all of our people that work. There were over 70-some volunteers. It takes over 350 people to run our church on a Sunday morning, and uh, the Lord is good. Amen? And so I just bring you greetings. We're, we're right in the middle of what God's doing. We had a conference, and we had an absolute move of God as people came from all 50 states and 30 different nations as far away as Saudi Arabia, and we had a lady come from China to a three-day conference. It takes three days to fly to Tulsa from China. I was just amazed, but, you know, when people are hungry, they'll do anything to get to where God is. Amen? They'll do anything to get to where God is, and so this morning, I want to share with you a word, and uh, I don't want to take long. Preachers don't usually say that, but I will this morning. I want to get right to the Word of God because I want to share with you, I think, uh, some of the things that God is doing in the earth. I have the privilege of traveling uh, on a continual basis now that I'm not a local pastor, and, and I get to see a lot and hear a lot and feel a lot 
of what God is doing and saying. The, the nation or the tribe of Issachar, the Bible said, understood the times and knew what Israel should do. I believe there's a voice in the, in the wilderness in this hour that is understanding what God's doing and, and trying to tell the church what it's supposed to do. And I have the privilege of traveling a lot and being with pastors and churches throughout the nation and overseas to help them see what God's doing in the earth in this hour. How many know God's up to something? Come on. God, say God's up to something. Come on. Nudge your neighbor. Elbow him a little bit. And say God's up to something. Are you here? Amen. And so with that in mind, I want to share with you, and I'm going to give uh, a few introductory comments because I want to give a, a contextual understanding of where we're going this morning. But, but Moses was a great leader. Uh, he was a deliverer, delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt, and, uh, and he was a lawgiver, and that was, that was his responsibility. And uh, he, he understood the presence of God so much that in Exodus chapter 33, he said, Lord, if you don't go with me, I'm not going. In other words, I'm willing to lead this people, but I'm only willing to lead this people if you're with me. And they recognize that you're with me because if they don't, I'm going to have a lot of trouble that I don't want to have in my, in my life. But I'll, I'll go if you go with me. And God said, I'll go with you. And so God goes with Moses, and later on, he shows up to Moses in a burning bush. That had to be an incredible experience, right? Because bushes just don't light up in front of you, first of all. And secondly, if they do, they don't burn very long because they're dry in the, in the wilderness, and, and they just are consumed immediately. But how many know when God consumes something, it has eternity in it? Which means that if God would have never left that bush, it would still be burning today. So when, when, when the eternal God comes into your life with fire, he decides that he wants to stay there. He wants to be there. And when, 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 when God shows up in a church in fire, how many know he's, he's coming to stay? He's coming to display his eternal nature among people of God. In other words, I'm with you, and I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what I did in the past, I'll do in the now, and I'm going to do it in the future. That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. And so Moses has this crazy experience with God in, in a burning bush, and God declares to him, because he asked God, he said, the people knew before they were in Egypt, they knew the God of your fathers. And so they understood the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but, but they, they've been here a few years, like 400 or more, and uh, they've, they've lost sight, so I need to tell them what your name is. What's your name, God? And he said, I am, which is an interesting way to answer that. But he was declaring to Moses, tell him I am, because I am always has been, is, and always will be. And so he was, he was trying to declare to the children of Israel that, that you knew me in the past, and I was in the past, but I'm in the present, and I will be in your future. Tell them I am has sent you. And so Moses goes back to the people and tells them, and God starts doing some miracles. And then it's, it's fascinating, towards the end of Exodus in the 40th chapter, God's, God asked God to show up in his glory. He says, show me your glory. And he said, I'll show you my glory, but you can't see my face. Because if you see my face, I've got to kill you. I mean, no, I'd say, well, it's fine. Show me whatever you want to show me, but I don't want to see your face, you know. But he, he, he shows Moses his glory. And then in the 40th chapter, he says this. He says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, which is the place where God meets with his people. How many know there should be a cloud where God meets with his people? It's a visible presence that, that he is there. And so as the, it said, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of God filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Later on it talked about the elders couldn't do their job because the glory was so thick they, they, they couldn't perform their normal duties. Wouldn't that be an awesome time if we showed up on Sunday morning and the clouds settled on this place and, and we couldn't see to play the instruments? We, you know, the lights don't matter when that cloud is that thick and the cloud just settled over the place and we just entertained the 
holy presence of an almighty God. I'm trying to tell you this morning, I think something's about to shift in the earth. Amen. It's about to shift in the earth. So all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they would not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the house house of Israel during their, their time of travel. So with that, I want to go to the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 9. And let's pick up the movement of the children of Israel as they're moving out of Egypt and moving towards the promises of God. How many know this is a symbol of our lives? It's a symbol of our lives. Every one of you here, including myself, have had a moment of Egypt or a day of Egypt, or a month of Egypt, or several years of Egypt. And some of you just came out of Egypt last week, but thank God you're here this morning. Amen. But all of us have had an Egypt in our life, our life before God, when we tried to do everything ourselves, and we felt like we were under the burden of life but couldn't get ahead, and we were frustrated. But thank God he calls us out of Egypt into eternal life with him. Amen. That starts on earth. If you're just looking for heaven one day, you're missing out on God on earth. Amen. He wants to rule and reign in our lives on earth. And so now the children of Israel are moving in, in through the, this, this time of, of, of moving into the promise. And the Bible says in Numbers chapter 9, verse 15, on the day of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and it calls it the tent of meeting because that's where God would meet with Moses and give instruction, and Moses would come out of the presence, and sometimes his face was so radiant the people couldn't even handle it, and he had to cover his face. That's awesome, amen? May God so, so in, in, empower us that his presence is automatically seen in our life everywhere we go in the neighborhood, Amen. On the streets when we're driving, even when somebody's driving in front of us and they're making us mad, amen, we, we keep radiant, amen, and don't get in the flesh. You know, some people say, well, I just honk my horn because I want them to know I'm back here. You know, no, you're mad. You say, get out of my way. All right, so on the day of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, meeting was set up and the cloud covered it. The cloud covered the place where God dwells. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle uh, uh, was a cloud above the tabernacle, and it looked like fire. That's how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night it looked like fire. There was still a cloud at night, but it looked like fire. All right? Whenever the cloud lifted above the tent, the Israelites set out. Whenever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and his command, they encamped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle for a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was over the tabernacle for a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp, and then at the Lord's command, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud stayed over from evening till morning. Mm. And when it lifted in the morning, they set out. Whether by day or night, whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year, the Israelites remained in camp and, and not set out. But when it lifted, they would set out. You say the Lord's repeating himself. He has to do that sometimes with us. Amen. At the Lord's command, they encamped. At the Lord's command, they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with his command through Moses. Fascinating time in the children of Israel because they had been in Egypt and they learned Egypt ways and they earned and they learned Egypt mentality and they learned Egypt systems like many of us in the world. The world taught us how to live and taught us how to get ahead and taught us how to treat people in its system and and so when you come out of Egypt, you need to relearn some things. And so now the children of Israel are coming out of Egypt. God had to get Egypt out of them. 
And that just doesn't happen overnight. Salvation or conversion is, is an immediate thing. But how many know we got to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? we got, we got to work this thing out because we have to get Egypt out of us because we cannot make excuses and say, that's just the way I am. Never declare that. That's the way you were. Amen. And so then God takes us through a process and renews us and gives us the mind of Christ and changes our attitudes and the way we see things. We become the children of God. So now they're coming out of Egypt, but he said, these people do not know my voice like they used to. Therefore, I will take them through the process of coming out of Egypt to the promise. And so now they build a tabernacle which houses the presence of God. It's like the church. Amen. Is that all right? And so it's like the church. And so now the tabernacle is in the center. So I want to preach from the message, move with the cloud. Come on, say with me. Move with the cloud. Look at your neighbor say, move with the cloud. No, like you preaching. Amen. They didn't even hear you. Come on. Look at them and said. The Bible says, move with the cloud. Mm -hmm. You're not, some of you aren't going to help me preach, but it's all right. Amen. And so I'm going to preach anyways. Move with the cloud is the message this morning. And I, so I want us to take a look at this because God was teaching them how to hear his voice. Now, we just read the text and it went through this elaborate time of saying no matter what when the cloud set they camped when the cloud moved they moved with the cloud and and then it went through a detailed uh, description that could be a day it could be from evening till morning now what we have to understand is that this is a few in fact the bible says there were 600,000 men ready for battle and it could have been as many as three million people moving through the desert, in camp, tents. So if you can bring up that, that next slide, if you have that, amen. If you can bring that up for me, I'd appreciate it, amen. So this is how they encamped. There were 12 tribes, and in the center you see is the tabernacle. That's the presence of God. And around them were the Levites, three tribes, and then the priests, Moses and the priests. Okay, they were around the tabernacle, and outside of them you see that there were three tribes and 12 all together that encamped around the tabernacle. What you need to make sure you do is always build your house around the presence of God. So, so this, is, this is a cool thing, but bring up the next slide. This is one, one person's thing. This was three million people that surrounded the tabernacle in the wilderness. Three million people that were in tents moving by the command of God. And God in the midst of it said, you know, if, 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 if I settle over the camp for a year, you can leave your tent up for a year. But if I move in a month, when I move, you got to move with me, which means you got to repack. And then, then all, all the... All the uh, the, 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 the priests and the Levites had to take down the tabernacle and they had to move it, which there were specific ways to move it because it represented the presence of God himself. And so, so now we got to repack everything, all the tent and all the things in the tent and all the things it takes to live and start moving with it. And now God says, no, we're going to move in a week now. We're going to move in a month now. No, you, we're going to move in a year now. And we'd say, well, God, can, can we talk about this? I mean, you know, if we could do it systematically, it might work better. In fact, we've gathered a committee. Amen. <laughs> and these, these are the deacons. And they've decided that if we move every three months, it's probably going to work better. We can, we can gather strength. We can move and then stay for three months and then move. And, and this, this is going to work better. I'm, so they wanted to take control. Isn't it sometimes we want to take control of God's house? But you can't control God. And what he was trying to teach them was his voice through leadership. Can you hear my voice once again, children of Israel? 
because I'm going to shake this thing up and it will not fall into your pattern any longer. Now this morning, in the midst of what I'm talking about is a prophetic word to the church. Because we seem to have this thing organized and structured and God needs to do certain things certain ways at certain times and then we're happy. And God said, well, I'm not happy. I want you to hear my voice and so I may shake it all up. I may do things different than you planned. Well, I like patterns, you know. I just feel comfortable in that. You know, if you sing three songs and then you read a scripture and then you preach and then we're out in an hour, I'm happy with that. And God said, wait a second. I'm God. You're the people. I'm leading you. And you got to hear my voice. So I, I, I may sing one song and then it, I may linger with that song for 30 minutes and then we move on. Well, you know, I prefer. No, it's not our preference. It's God's voice. And so he was trying to teach the children of Israel his voice. His voice. And so they had to learn to hear his voice through leadership because leadership had to focus on the cloud. And when the cloud moved, they announced the cloud is moving. Pack up. Get ready. We're going into the next. We're moving from this place that we're at. Because we want to settle and God wants to move. And I don't know about you, but I've been in this all my life for over 45 years of pastoring. And, and I want to stay with God. I don't want to settle anywhere. I want to move with God. And it's not always moving locations, but it's moving in the realm of the spirit. God, have your way. We, we say that, but do we really mean it? Because if God has his way, he's going to change us. And he's going to reveal things he's not happy about. And it doesn't matter what your title is. Well, I'm a pastor. I'm a bishop. I'm this. I'm a doctor. Well, God's not moved by titles. He's moved by hearts. And he wants to change us. So he is moving with the people. So go to that next slide. Just keep the slides up. I'll just stay with it. Amen. I don't want to see my name. All right. So there, there's, there's a picture of the tabernacle. This is at night, and the cloud looked like fire, and these are the tents of the entire nation of Israel around it. Now, this is massive. Three million people moving together according to one cloud, according to one cloud, hearing God's voice. What does that mean, that he's going to speak in an audible voice? Not often and not to many people. Now, he did to Moses. But God moved, and Moses spoke, and the people moved with him. And so I want to give you some practical things this, this morning that I hope are going to help you in relation to the cloud. Because every generation has to learn how to hear God. And God's about to do some things in the church that none of us have ever seen before. I just came out of that conference I talked about. And there was a move of God at a level I've never seen before. And I've seen a lot of stuff over the years. I've never seen anything like that. And it was a sign in the natural of what God's about to do worldwide. There were people from 30 different nations that are, that are just spread out all over the world that were in the midst of that. And at one time in the meeting on, on uh, I think it was Wednesday night, um, Pastor Michael got up and said, I, I, you know, and God was doing some great things. And there was just this, you feel, have you ever felt waves in the spirit? It's just, it was just moving through the audience and you could see things happening and nobody was trying to orchestrate it. And, and he says, I know you think because we have all these lights and this huge sound system and this big stage that, that it's all about that. He said, okay. He said, turn the lights off the stage. He turned them off. And he said, now the other lights, he said, turn those lights off. And he turned the lights off, and there were just little lights on in the auditorium. And then he said, he said, turn the auditorium lights off. And he turned the auditorium lights off. And then he said, turn the mic off. And he turned the mic off, and he said, nobody's going to orchestrate this. Before they turned to me, he said, nobody's going to orchestrate this. This is going to be God. And all of a sudden, all the lights are off. All the sound system is off. Everything is off. And there's 4,000 people in an auditorium, and all of a sudden, there, there started a wave of God's presence in the place that was undescribable. It was a sovereign move of the Spirit. And I said, God, is this a sign of things about to happen? 
He said, I am taking over in my church. I'm sovereign. You know what sovereign means? Sovereign means I am absolute in control. I'm God, and I'm God all by myself, and you don't vote on me. I'm not elected for four years. I'm God, and I can do what I want, when I want, how I want without your permission because I'm God, and I'm not omniscient, omnipotent. I'm all everywhere present. I, I can just, I, I'm all knowing. I, I can do anything I want, and I know what I'm doing. And I'm about to move in the earth like never before. Now, some of you might be sitting there saying, what does that mean? I just, I come to church and I like church and that's good. I'm telling you God's about to move. God's about to move. Let me give you just some quick things. Number one, the cloud represents God's covering of protection. The cloud represents God's covering of protection. Because if, if you've never been in that area of the country, in the day the sun is incredible. Incredibly hot. But he said, I'll be a cloud over you because I'll protect you from the sun by day. And at night when it gets cold, even in the desert, I'll be fire. I will protect you. I'm here to tell you this morning, God's going to protect his church. It's his church. It's not our church. We don't own it. We're a part of it. We help build it. But it's God's church. Can I get an amen? It's God's church. But he said, I want you to know as the people, I'll protect you. And what I'm about to do, you need to know there's protection by God. I'm going to cover you. I'm going to protect you from the, from the heat of the day and the cold of the night. I'm going to protect you. Secondly, the cloud represents God's direction for the future. God's direction for the future. If, and we have to believe in a future or we're stuck in a present. If you're stuck in the present, there's nowhere to go. God forbid if we're just stuck, because because if you're stuck, there's nowhere to go, which means you have where you're going. This is it. But how many know there's more in life to what you've experienced before? Amen? God, God wants to do some new and fresh things in your life and for your life and for your family. And, and, and if you got a wayward son or daughter, amen, I, I'm with you. i got one right now that's living on the streets. It's drug addiction. And I, I'm saying, God, you got to move. I gave that boy to you when he was a little boy. You got to move. You think preachers don't have problems? Amen. But God's moving. God's moving. He said, he said, my cloud is going to give direction to the future. It's going to unfold the future. You know what hope is? Hope is, is I can go beyond where I'm at into my future. That's hope. That's hope. You can't live without hope. You can't live without hope because the, the present has enough to consume you overwhelm you and make you want to quit but the future says you can keep going keep going it's rough now I know but take one more step it doesn't look like you're gonna make it just take one more step because the future keeps pulling us into where God wants us to be so it's direction for your future and thirdly God's cloud is authorization of leadership authorization so it's protection it's direction and it's authorization. Because the last scripture we read, it says, he said, you're going to follow Moses' command because he's, I'm putting the responsibility on him to make sure he views the cloud at all times. And I'm sure he had people that were around him. He said, if I'm going to take a, a light nap, you watch the cloud. And the minute you see any movement at all, let me know because I got I to gotta direct the affairs of the people. I got to let them know it's time to move. And there might have been some people to say, you know what? I'm tired of moving. You all move. I'm staying here. It's horrible when you want to build a house in the desert because there's no food and water unless God is there. So the cloud represents those things. The cloud represents change. It represents breaking traditions. It, let, it, it represents letting go of preferences and saying, God, it's all you. I like certain songs, and I like this, and I like that, but you know what? If you're not doing that right now, it's okay with me. I just want to move with you. I just want to understand you're here. 
I want your glory. I want you to, to protect my life and oversee my life. I, I, I tried all my life to run my life, and I messed up, and I tried to produce a future, and I got in debt, and I tried to do this, and it failed. And, but now in you, I have another chance. I have another chance. Amen? So let me give you things, four things very quickly that happens when the cloud moves. Number one, there's impartation. There's impartation. You know what impartation is? It means when you're in the midst of it, God just settles over you and imparts. He drops something on the inside of you that you need. Some of you need strength. And you feel like you're weak in this hour and you don't have the strength to do what God's called you to do. When God settles over you and imparts strength, you have the strength of God. Oh, it'll out far outweigh your strength because his strength is made perfect. And, you know, it, it just, it finds you and is perfect in his love. Amen? That's God's strength. And so, so there's an impartation. The Bible said in Numbers uh, chapter 11, it says, The Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. In other words, in that moment, the 70 elders that are surrounding Moses, he said he imparted his spirit to them, and they all began to prophesy. I'm not a prophet, but in that moment, there was an impartation. There's sometimes that you need an impartation. You don't have the answer for your teenage children that are going crazy in that moment. And then you speak and there's a word that comes out of you. It's an impartation of God's spirit that we need. Secondly, not only was there an impartation, but there was an interruption of routine. There was an interruption of routine. Routines, if you're not careful, can be ruts. Somebody said, what is a rut? It's an elongated grave. It's something that you're caught in. Have you, have you ever hit uh, a place in the snow? Probably you have. I'm describing what you understand. And, 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 and a lot of people have traveled that, but it now there's snow on the side of it, and down in that rut's been highly traveled, and now it's ice. And you get caught in it, and it's hard to get out because there's packed snow around it, and your tires in that rut. Well, life can sometimes produce ruts, and we get caught in it. But I mean, no, in God, amen, he can get you out where nothing else can get you out. God can get you out. In other words, he said, I'm going to not only help you maneuver, I'm just going to lift you out and put you on my highway. Hallelujah. And so he interrupts routines. He interrupts routines. Well, God, I've scheduled one hour for Sunday morning. I hope the preacher doesn't get long-winded. Amen, because I got one hour, and I, I want to fit you into it. You're caught in a rut. If you give God your Sunday mornings and open up your heart, he can set your whole week in motion. You can get things done that would take you a month in a normal time if you really give your heart and your ears to hear the voice of God. In one hour can change your whole week if you learn to give yourself. He interrupts routine. God may want to speak to you while you're driving. Now, don't get spiritual and close your eyes. Amen. That would not be a good thing. Amen. But he want, may want to speak to you while you drive. And I mean, no, you can pray with your eyes open. I recommend that if you're driving. Amen. But, but, you know, use that time. I hate traffic. Well, sometimes God may slow you up because he wants to speak to you. Let him interrupt your routine. Don't lock God into Sunday mornings. He's everywhere present all the time. Amen. And he wants to speak to you. Thirdly, the cloud moving represents seasonal manifestation, modification. Seasonal modification. In other words, sometimes there's a shift about to take place. We are on the edge of a shift right now. I'm telling you. I've studied this for 45 years. We are on the edge of a shift for the church in this hour. And so there's seasonal modification. Remember when Elijah prophesied there's going to be a drought, the king tried to kill him? Sometimes they don't like bad prophecies, right? And so now, now he's looking for God to ship because he sees and he senses something. He saw the rain before it came. And then he went and he asked his servant, go out and check to see if you see anything. The 
The servant went out, and he looked and said, no, prophet, didn't see anything. He said, go back. He goes back. He looks again. He said, no, prophet. About third or fourth time, he thinks the prophet's losing it. He's getting a little senile. I've been three or four times. How many times is he going to ask you? And he keeps asking him to go out and go out. And then one time he goes out, and he said, okay, prophet. And he looks, and he's, oh, I see something. At least I can tell him I see something. It's about the size of a man's hand, but it ain't much, but I can tell him that. And he runs back, and he said, yeah, prophet, I saw something. It's a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And, and, and uh, Elijah said, that's it, that's it. He, he picked up his cloak, and he said, let's start running because the rain is about to come. It was a seasonal change that was about to happen. They were in a drought, and a drought means no food, and a food means you're in trouble because you can't eat. But when the rain comes, look out. I'm telling you, it's about to rain. It's about to rain. It's about to rain. And then fourthly, as I close, there's, when the cloud moves, there's an intervention of God's presence. An intervention of God's presence. Isaiah 19 verse 1 says, See the Lord rise on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble before him and the hearts of the Egyptians will melt within them. When the cloud comes, God's intervening presence comes. And evil and things that have tried to come against you and lawsuits and and bankruptcies and all these things are trying to come against you, God said, I'm about to intervene. I'm going to ride a swift cloud, and I'm coming your direction. And I'm, my presence is about to shift everything for you. And your enemies that have tried to overtake you are going to melt in fear of my presence. We are about to enter a move of God. I've been waiting my whole life. My brother has studied revivals for over 20 years, written two books on it. And he came on that, that Wednesday night to that service. And he said, for the first time in almost 70 years, he said, I saw what I've been looking for. I came to tell you, not just encourage you, but tell you God's about to shift in the earth. And we're about to see the cloud move. Come on, say move with the cloud. Come on, look at your neighbor say, move with the cloud. cloud. It's moving. This church is strategically orchestrated by God. 35 years of history. This couple have pastored this church. 35 years. You know what the average length of a pastor is in a church? Five. They walked in this town, in this church for 35 years. They have been faithful in ups and downs. People coming and crying and saying, this is God, and then leaving in three weeks. Because God spoke to them about something else. Ups and downs, ins and outs, and they've stayed faithful week after week, month after month, year after year. And I'm telling you, it's all led up to this season that we're in now. And God is about to move. God's about to move. I see, I see the seeds of God's move in the earth in this church. And I've been coming 25 years. And I'll be back, and so I just can't say anything. I see it. I see it. It's about to happen. And you that are over 40, relax. I'm going to help you in the next five minutes. i got five minutes. I'm going to help you. Relax. You're going to see things that you haven't seen, and you're not even sure yet. You're going to, have to, you're going to look at it and try to evaluate it. Relax. You get to be a part of it. I'm talking for me, too. I get to be a part of it. I struggle every time I'm out of, out of Tulsa on a Sunday because there's a move of God in our church. There's a move at such a level I've never seen in all 45 years of pastoring. But I see it everywhere. I go, I just saw it in Omaha two weeks ago. I saw it here when I landed. You are strategically uh, 
set on something that's going to shift God's move in this entire area. I won't even limit it to Stephen's point in this entire area. This church, because of the faithfulness of your pastor for 35 years, there's a shift and transition coming. It's okay. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. So if you're older, this, you've been here, and you helped build this church, and we applaud you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Yesterday I heard a, a couple of people said they were here 30 years and 35 years. I said, that's awesome. That is awesome. I applaud you. Thank you for faithfulness. You helped build this church. You, you, you believed God when it needed a miracle, and you stepped up to the plate. But don't isolate yourself from what God's about to do. I'm going to do something. Can I, can I just obey God? I just, I sense. I want every person who's 35 or younger to stand in front of me right now. Get out of your seat. You're 35 or younger. Come right up here. I need you, Jeff, up here if you come. Just stay with me. It won't be long. But I, the moment you're looking for is about to happen, Pastor Matt. I'm just telling you right now. Come on, just crowd in. I want everybody at the altar. Everybody at the altar. I didn't expect this. Look at this. Y'all looking around? Come on, make room. Just come on off, off the side. I want you up here. 35 or younger. Somebody said, I'm 36, but I feel 35. You can come. All right, come on. <laughs> come on. All right. Let me help you. You. I sense God. You are going to lead the next move of God. And I apologize to you. That we didn't include you. got to forgive us for that. It wasn't in our heart. We just didn't know how to do it. But you are the future of the church. We've worked hard and we've given hard and we've prayed hard. But it was all for you. But there's things that God has to do in you too. Because you're most, mostly millennials. You've heard that term a thousand times. Probably too much. But you're mostly millennials are standing here and millennials haven't really looked at the church and felt like they could connect with it but you can in fact you can become it God's going to use you in this church if you're in college you might be here three or four years and if you feel led to leave you can take it with you if you feel led to stay you can be a part of it but I'm telling you God's going to use you. And we want you to know that we're behind you. I'm speaking prophetically because some of them might not agree, but I pray in the process you'll agree with me. This is the church of the future. Right here, right now, this is the church. So you're going to have a young adult service in what, a week or two? One week? And I want you to let go. I want you to let go. I want you to enjoy God's presence the way you want to enjoy God's presence. I don't want you to be limited by what you've seen in us. I want you to enjoy God the way you want to enjoy God. And find God the way you want to find God, but find Him. If you have hang-ups and hobbies that don't glorify Him, lay Him down. You're standing at an altar right now. Lay it down. Let it go. Because God wants to use you in ways that you haven't even dreamed yet. And we want God to use you. In the near future, there won't be. I'm just going to speak prophetically. And Pastor can correct this or give direction to it later. But I just have to say what I sense. There's coming a time in the future when you won't have a young adult ministry. This will be a young adult church. And all of us who are older will get to be a part of it. 
we will join with you and we'll continue to surround you and pray for you and we're going to be in the middle of it you might be jumping and we might be but it's okay it's okay let us let us do what we can right amen and 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 we'll do it together we'll do it together that's the bible way that's the bible way but i ask you don't look from the outside jump in the middle Millennials do not like to watch. They like to participate. So let the weights go. Let them, let them drop. Let the intimidations go. In, in a week, fill this place. Bring every friend you know. But what if they don't understand? R- relax. You invite them. God will do the rest. Get them. Get them. Bring them here. Bring them here. Feel this entire sanctuary. If you got to take out the chairs, take out the chairs. Turn up the sound system. And if you all don't like it, don't come. But let them be themselves and let them be themselves in God. I just want to encourage you. I just want to encourage you. I, I have talked to pastors at least three times since I've been here. I said, the leadership that's evolving in this church is astounding. I go to some churches that are 3,000 people and don't have some of the leadership potential I've seen here in the last week. You all have got something. Don't let it go. Press in. Press in. They just hired a new children's pastor. I don't know if she's here. She's in the back with the kids. But I met her, and there's such an anointing upon her, and I guess she's getting married. Is her, is her fiancé here this morning? No, he's, he's not. Okay. But putting together the worship team that's forming, the young adult leaders, I, I'm telling you, this thing is real. Just lift your hands right now. Lift your hands at this altar. You know, when we lift our hands, it's not just a religious thing. It's a surrender thing. It's a surrender thing. If you're here this morning and you've not made a real commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, now's the time. Now's the time. Ninety-five percent of people that were raised in the church when they go to college lose their faith. Some of you are about to find your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's about to shift and change everything in your life. Everything in your life. All over this auditorium with hands raised, say, Lord Jesus, today, right now, and right here, I give you my life. I'm asking you to be my Lord and Savior. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me from my past. Give me new life. I desire to serve you from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Come on, say, in Jesus' name. If you made that prayer for the first time, the Bible says that you are saved. You confess the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to go through 28 weeks of discipleship before we recognize that you love God. Today, right here, right now, you have made a declaration, I want to serve Jesus. And we'll walk with you. Young adult ministry, church, pastors, we'll walk with you. We'll help you. We don't expect perfection tomorrow. All we ask is progression, not perfection, progression. Let's just move forward. Let's let some weights drop off. Maybe this week, two or three will drop off. And next week, a couple more will drop off. A few months, you're going to walk in freedom that you never even thought possible. You are the church of tomorrow. But tomorrow begins today. Tomorrow begins today. Get those friends out. Come a week from when? Do you have the date? A week from today, next Sunday night. Bring your friends. 
take the cap off, whatever that cap, take it off. Let this place just explode with God. Amen. You all enjoy God, whatever that is. Enjoy God. If it's jumping, if it's, I don't know, just, just enjoy God, right? Raise the music up. Don't kill the speakers, but push them a little bit, all right? Get some music in here. Get somebody crazy on electric guitar. Amen. Let's, let's enjoy the presence of God in the midst of what we know, what we know. I'm telling you, church, and please hear me once again. If you're 40 and over and all that, just let me tell you once again, we get to be a part of it. Every time I'm in Tulsa, I'm on the front row in the middle of our church. It's known all over the world. We have 60,000 people that watch us on the Internet every Sunday. Go to YouTube and look up Crazy Faith. You'll see our pastor. He's crazy. He speaks the language. He's cool. He's funny. He's, just, he's relevant. He's just, just look it up. Crazy Faith. You'll see. But it's going to happen here. It's going to happen through you. Amen. Now, everybody out there, did you hear what I said? That make myself clear. We get to be a part of it. Don't look and wonder. Join in. Join in. I, I don't know when, but I can just tell you, in the near future, we're going to shift. And, and you won't have a separate service. This will be the service. And we'll all get to do it together. And we might even reach back every now and then. Sing a little different, but I'm even singing him. But it's going to be a little different. But it, it's, we do that at our church. We do that at our church to say we connect with our past, but we're moving into our future. Amen. Everybody lift your hands as pastor comes. Father, I thank you this morning that something in the realm of the spirit has shifted and changed. And I thank you, Lord, for the faithful service for 35 years of Pastor Deborah and Pastor Matt. Thank you, Lord, for their obedience. Thank you, Lord, for shifting this church in the last three or four years to prepare for this and so much more. We honor you as we commit our lives to you and to what you're about to do. The cloud is moving, God. Let us move with the cloud in Jesus' name. If you believe that, can you clap your hands and give the Lord a shout? Can you give the Lord a, a shout of praise? Come on. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wow. What you're experiencing in this moment is what we call a defining moment. So what decision will you make? As for me, I want to be part of this. You know, even though I'm 62, I'm going to be part of this. And I am thrilled to see what God is doing in this generation. About six years ago, I came, Deb and I came under strong conviction because we were not reaching this young generation, these millennials that are standing before us. And we knew we needed to be strategic and make some changes because we didn't want to be responsible for losing the generation that followed us. And so our commitment is to pour into you, to raise you up, so that you go far beyond anything that we've ever accomplished. And that's our desire and our joy. So I'm, I'm thrilled. This message is really a prophetic word to us. And as we embrace this, God is going to do something so incredible. You might not think God could do something with your life, but he can do something amazing with your life. I never thought I'd stand up on a platform and preach to people or do things, go into mission trips and do things to change the world. I never thought that, but God has used me at least a little bit. But I believe he's going to use you a lot to do significant things in this earth for the glory of his name and for his kingdom because eternity is a lot longer than this life on earth. And what we accomplish in this life determines what we will do for eternity and God's reward and his presence. If you would at this time, go ahead and return to your seats. And we believe it's important to just honor Bishop Gary McIntosh with a, a love offering. 
And um, if you are using, doing this online or through PushPay, there is a line designated for guest minister with Gary McIntosh's name. And, and so if you do that, if you're using PushPay, uh, make sure you designate there. But close your eyes for just a moment. And in this moment, just yield yourself to Jesus. He wants to do so much in you in order to do something through you. But the work begins first in you. And just let your heart cry be, change me, Lord. Change me into the person you want me to be. Make my life what you want it to be. Surrender your will to his as Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, not my will, but thy will be done. Embrace that in your life. You will never, ever regret it. Amen. Well, you can open your eyes. When you think about it, that prayer is a simple prayer. Not my will, but thy will be done. But I challenge you to pray that prayer. And I promise you, you will not regret it. Not for a minute. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be issues that you have to contend with. But you won't regret that decision that prayer. Amen. So when we honor someone who's ministered the word, the Bible actually says honor those who deliver the word of God, and we want to do that. Uh, purpose in your heart to do something just out of respect, respect and honor for what we've received this morning. And when Bishop Gary came, he didn't ask for anything. He just showed up. And he came, I want to help you build what God's called you to build. Not many ministers are that way. They usually come because they have their ministry. And they have their agenda. But his agenda as a friend, as a partner in ministry is, is to help us accomplish what God's called us to do, to reach our city, to reach our community, to reach our world for Jesus. And Bishop Gary actually serves as an overseer of this church. He's somebody that I can call on if I have a question, if we're going through something. He's a voice of wisdom and counsel to speak into the leadership of this church. And, and as long as he's alive, as long as I'm alive, that's going to always be the case. So we value this relationship. And so we want to bless this man of God and his wife. And if you haven't met his wife, Debbie, you will. Well, someday we're going to have her back again too. But she's an amazing woman of God who walks in love and, and is partner by Gary's side. They serve faithfully the purpose of God together. So let's pray as we prepare our offerings, as we honor this man of God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you that it's not so much about money, it's about honor. And one way we can show honor is, is through gifts. And Father, we purpose in our heart to, to sow a financial seed to honor this man of God and we thank you for the message that you brought us today. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. Amen. Well, let's stand up. We're going to worship together. Let's honor God in this moment.